Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. I'm Mark Golub, and if you know the book of Genesis, you know that the first place in which Abraham settled when he crossed into the land of Canaan was Elon Moreh, the plains of Moreh, where the Torah tells us God first informs Abraham that God is giving the land of Canaan, Haaretz, Eretz Yisrael, to the descendants of Abraham, and where Abraham built the first altar to God near the city of Shechem. The land, of course, is on the West Ridge, what's been called the West Bank. And after the Six-Day War of 1967, when the West Ridge was liberated from Jordanian control, a group of Israelis were moved to return to the biblical site and to establish a Jewish community, Nilo and Moreh. It was a complicated process, especially in the 1970s. The entire issue of new Israeli communities being built on the liberated West Ridge was sensitive, controversial, and volatile. But in 1979, the new Israeli Prime Minister at the time, Menachem Begin, gave the group the right to create a Jewish community of Elon Moreh, which was moved to another nearby location by the Israeli Supreme Court in 1980 when it was determined the original site was Arab-owned land. Today, Elon Moreh is a small Orthodox community of roughly 2,500 Israelis and is viewed by many in the international community and in the Jewish community as well as an illegal Israeli settlement. Of course, most American Jews have never visited the West Ridge, though any Jew who's visited the Western Wall in the old city of Jerusalem has been to the West Ridge, the same as if that Jew had visited Elon Moreh. But in the minds of most American Jews, West Ridge Jewish communities are settlements and are viewed as an obstacle to peace with the Palestinian people. Well, who are the Jews who live in Elon Moreh? And what's it like to live in that West Ridge community? And how do the residents of Elon Moreh view the claim that they're part of an illegal Jewish movement on the West Ridge? For some insight, I'm so pleased to be sitting with Zev Safer, an American Jew who made Aliyah, now lives in Elon Moreh, and he actually helped to found the city. And Zev, it's a pleasure having you here. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I first want to understand how you come to move to, from Israel, from America to Israel, make Aliyah, and then ultimately to Elon Moreh. You were born in America where? I was born in Brooklyn. Yes. And at a young age, at about five years old, my father was originally from Spring Valley, New York. Yes. What was and his name? Martin Saffer. Marty Saffer. Marty. And he grew up in Spring Valley. Uh, my grandfather was one of the first settlers, the Jewish community in Spring Valley at the Interesting. time. Interesting, yes. And he started the yeshiva there and the first shul. My father was the first... Uh, started a young Israel there when he was a young man. And uh, when I was about five years old, we moved back, we moved back to Spring Valley. He moved ah. back to Spring Valley. Um, that's where his parents were still there and his family. Uh, we were living in Brooklyn near my mother's parents. What was your mother's Barrow name? Park, Besh. Besh. Bash, Bash. Yeah, Bash. And uh, we moved to Spring Valley. And, and that's where I of, grew up. Okay, so when you move back, you're, I'm just, you're obviously in an Orthodox community. Mm -hmm. Your whole family's been involved in yeshiva and Jewish education life. But what was, how would you define the Jewish household you grew up in? I should have asked you. Any siblings? Yes, I have four uh, siblings. And where are you? Um, I'm the oldest. You're the oldest. Yes. So you and your four 
younger siblings, growing up in your parents' home, what was the Jewish character of the home? It was very Jewish. We all went to yeshiva. Uh, my father would go to the shul. He was very active in the, in the synagogue. And uh, we had a thorough Orthodox Jewish upbringing. Lovely. Obviously, Shomer Mitzvot. Yes. Shomer yes. Shabbat, Shomer Kashrut, the whole... Yes. Okay. And as you were growing up, did you love this Jewish thing, the Jewishness? I didn't have another thought to yes. it. That's, that's what I was born into, and yes. I didn't think else, or, you know, anything else. It was interesting, though, uh, growing up, I didn't feel any different than anyone else. Mm -hmm. um, being a, a third generation born in the United States, my grandfather was born in the United States, I felt as American as anyone else. Uh, we celebrated Thanksgiving, I had the turkey, everything, yes. you know, along with it. Uh, July 4th, picnics. Uh, you were an American Jew. Yes. Yes. Then where do you go to school after, after yeshiva? Well, I went to Yeshiva University, to college. Here in New York. In New York. Okay. And uh, I was married in my second year of college. Lovely. And made Aliyah four years later. Because, I should have asked you incidentally, what was the Zionist sentiment in your parents' home growing up? It, there really wasn't a Zionist uh, element there. I mean, we were, we didn't talk too much about Israel. Interesting. I went to a, a yeshiva that today would be considered uh, probably uh, Hasidish. Yes. Uh, at the time, was Israel in that curriculum? No. no. So it's interesting, Zeb. You grow up, obviously, an observant, loving Jew, but it's not about Israel. Correct? Correct. At what point do you begin to feel a pull towards Israel and for Israel? As a teenager, we started a youth group in Spring Valley in Muncie also, that was connected to the Mizrahi Women's Organization. It was called Mizrahi Hatzair, which was similar to Bnei Akiva, but it was an or, a different offshoot. And uh, that's where we pretty much started to get the Zionistic feeling. In that group, we would meet on Shabbat. We would have uh, discussions about Israel. We would try to help Israel as much as we can with different projects. And uh, that's really where it started. Okay. Is this after the Six-Day War or before the Six-Day War? Before. Before the Six-Day War. Do you remember the Six-Day War? Oh, yes. Do you remember Mostly. being frightened for Israel during that period of time? Definitely. Definitely. And then? We went our whole school. I was at the time in high school. Yes. And we all went to Washington. We had a big rally in Washington at the time. Mm -hmm. And even though I was going, again, to a very orthodox yeshiva in Baltimore, near Israel, to high school, um, all the schools turned out. We all went to Washington. We, we, even though I was a third generation born in America, and I re never experienced uh, anti-Semitism, I still felt that this country, America, as good as it is to me, wasn't my country. I didn't feel that um, I, can, I can say that, that uh, the United States is mine. I always was, I, I, I think, you know, the war years, uh, I heard stories from my father. He was a soldier in Europe during the war in the United States Army. I think I was affected by that very much, what, what went on there. In what way? And how the Jews were, were at the top of, of every society, and they had a fantastic life, and it just overnight fell apart. And you felt in some way it was being replicated in America? Not at the time. I, don't th I didn't think it was, but I thought maybe it could be. It could, I see. It could be. And also, I think what did it for me was with well, the first time when I turned 18 and I had, there were elections for president, the first time I voted, I would vote, who is good for Israel? And it bothered me because I'm an American. 
I should vote for who is good for America. And I think that affected me also. So I felt very strongly that if I want to be in a land, in a place that I can say is mine, uh, the only place would be Israel. Okay. So this happens to you around the age of 18? Yes. Okay. Then you end up at Yeshiva University. Mm -hmm. Four years? Four years. And you get, you, I thought you said you get married while you're in Yeshiva. University. Second yes. year university. Okay. Yeshiva University. You graduate. Mm -hmm. How soon after that do you decide to make Aliyah? We knew before. We had, when we were married, uh, when, when uh, we became engaged, I went to my parents to tell them that we're getting engaged and we plan on moving to Israel. And How'd they feel? Well, I'll tell you, about uh, a few months later, my father says he's going to Israel to make a pilot trip. And they made Aliyah in 1970 while we were still in Yeshiva University. Amazing. So when you followed, you ultimately followed your parents. They were there yes. waiting for you. Yes. Isn't that lovely? What about your other siblings? They went with them. They were all younger than me. My oldest sibling was my sister. She was 16 when they made Aliyah. Okay. Had you been to Israel already at least once? Yes. When we were, we were married, we went on our honeymoon to Israel. And uh, my brother was bar mitzvah there that summer. And then we went like uh, a year later to visit my family. Okay. So you moved to Israel. And where do you establish your residence? We were first in a new immigrant absorption center in Ramat Gan. This is in 1975? 1974. Four. This is? June. Okay, so this is after the Yom Kippur War. Yes, yes. That was another harrowing time, wasn't it? Yes, because my parents were there at the time. Very frightening. And uh, we, you know, here we didn't hear everything that was going on. Yes. And uh, my parents were surprised that we weren't calling them every hour. But uh, after the Six-Day War, I guess we were a little more confident that Israel could uh, defend itself. Yes. All right, you get there, and it's in 1975, and you end up living where? 74. In 74, you live living where? We were in Ramat Gan, in Ramat the absorption Gan. center, and the mother of the, uh, the, the, the they call it mother, the, the, the Aim Habayit. Yes. The mother of the home. The, the she one ran in the charge place. of, she of ran the place. The place. Uh, said to my wife, you're pregnant, you're in your uh, seventh month with your second child, you have to go immediately to the uh, mother of, uh, baby center and register, which was a few blocks away. And the next day my wife went. She was sitting there and she met another young mother that looked like she was also an, an American. It turned out to be... Uh, someone by the name of Marsha Slomiansky, who was married to, he became a Knesset member and head of the finance committee in the Knesset, Nissan Slomiansky. And we became very good friends with them. He was also involved in Gush Emunim at the time, which was the organization that was starting all of the trouble there, so-called trouble with the Jewish, uh, wanting to go and renew the Jewish presence in, in the uh, Shomron, and uh, he told me that there are, there are no Jews living in the Shomron. The government doesn't let them go. And to me, coming from the United States, and I didn't know what the green line was. I didn't know that there are places like Shiloh, like Elon More, that Jews are not allowed to live. I felt that, how can this be? You know, this is my country. Again, I came, I came from America to my country, and I found out that, well, Jews are not allowed to live. I mean, Jews can live anywhere they want in, in the United States. Why can't they live in, in Israel? So I felt that this was something that had to be corrected. And he told me, well, we're having a meeting and forming a group. And uh, if you'd like to come, 
you can come to the meeting with me. And I went to the meeting, and it turned out that it was a group that wanted to set up uh, just over the border, the old border, and today it's called uh, El Kana, that town. And I joined the group, and I was on the committee, uh, central committee of the group. And then in 1975, another group, which was the Elon Moret group, got permission. Uh, they tried seven times, and on Hanukkah, the eighth time, which was a coincidence, but that was the eighth time, they received permission to go to a town called, it wasn't a town yet, it was an army camp called Camp Kadum. And uh, we, on the central committee of this other group, decided in solidarity we're going to have our next meeting in Kadum. And uh, we're going to show our support for them. We went to the meeting in Kadum, and they, they, the, the group is called Elon Moret, and they were call, trying to call the town Elon Moret, but the government wasn't letting them because they said Elon Moret is closer to Shechem. So they were calling themselves Elon Moret Kadum at the time. And when we, after we had our meeting, they came, uh, representatives of the town came to talk to us. And they said, look, you know, it's all nice you're going, you know, trying to get permission to go to where you're, you want to set up, but we're here now, and we need your help now. I went home and told my wife, we're going to help them out now. We're not waiting. We had already, uh, we were, at that point, we were living in Petach Tikva. We had a rented apartment, and we had bought an apartment that was being built. We went uh, out to Kadum. We said, when our group goes, we'll join them. Uh, but meanwhile, we'll help you out. And they weren't too happy about that, but in the end, they said, okay, come. Why weren't they happy? They wanted people to stay with them. They didn't you want know, people was... that were coming temporarily. I see. I see. So, uh, but in the end, we did go, but we did stay ter f permanently with them, with the group. Mm -hmm. um, in 1977, in May 19th, I believe it was, Menachem Begin was just elected the prime, as a prime minister of Israel. The next day, he came to Kadum, Elon Moreh Kadum, and he said, there will be many Elon Morehs. There will be no need for Kadum. And it came true because since we wanted to be closer to Shechem all the time, that was a compromise to be in Camp Kadum, we decided to try to get permission to get closer to Shechem. And explain to the Yoyas what Shechem is. Nablus. Yes. That's an Arab. And Nablus was, was called Neapolis by the Romans. It was a Roman city. Originally, that's where Jacob bought his... Chalkat HaSadeh, his portion of land uh, outside of the town walls. And uh, it's an ancient town. At the time of Jacob, it was there. The story with Dina went into Shechem. And Shechem has biblical roots recorded in the Torah. Yes. Okay. And then ultimately it becomes an Arab city. And the problem... People should understand that, again, if, if, if they don't remember or this is new, there was a huge issue in the 1970s about whether Jews should be in territories that either were owned by Arabs or that Arabs felt they had, they had in some way the rights to. And then there were issues of how close could an Israeli community be built near an Arab city. So one of the things that your group is dealing with is you want to return to what was a biblical center for the Jewish people. And you want it to be Elon Morat, which is close to Shem. And at the same time, the Israeli government is saying this is problematic. And before Menachem Begin is elected in a surprise election, the, the government was very resistant to 
to any of the movements you were trying to make. You're saying now Begin comes the very next day to your community. Mm -hmm. Were you there? Yes, I was. You remember seeing him? Yes, of course. What a, that must have been of quite course. something, yes? Of course, yes, the prime yes. Minister of, the new Prime Minister of Israel we, coming to see you. He dedicated a Sefer Torah in the town on that day. Did you like Begin? And uh, we thought uh, at the time when he was elected, we celebrated all night. <laughs> we watched the elections. Uh, on a, on a, someone had a TV outside. He put it outside because we were living in, in these mobile caravans at the time. And the whole town just was around that TV. And when that election, when the results came through. Thrilling, right? We didn't go to sleep that night. I understand. He was, he was a member of Elon More, by the way. I didn't know that. Uh, what does that mean, yes. he was a member of Elon More? He was very supportive of, uh, of us. He, yes. came, he came to some of the attempts uh, that we had. And um, he, 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 at one time, was thinking of living in Elon More. I know that toward the end of his life, he decided he wanted to live in Yamit, which then got torn down. Yes. Okay, yes. I didn't know that he was interested in Elon Moret. Okay, 70s. so he comes and he tells you, you know what? There are going to be many of these. Elon Moret. Elon Moret. Elon Moret. And you're now working to move close to the Shechem. Right. Tell me the story. So we get permission to move to a hilltop next to Shechem. Uh, the Arab town nearby was called Rojeb, and that's when the Supreme Court, some Arabs uh, went to the Supreme Court and claimed that the land that we were on, which uh, wasn't true, but they claimed that uh, we were on their land. Zeb, how do you know it wasn't true? Afterwards, when, they, when, when, when they, we were told that the land will go back to them, it never did. There's a Jewish town there now. Why did the Supreme Court get it wrong? I'm not, it's, it's very complicated. I'll there's try no to explain answer? it. No, there's a very simple answer. The Israeli Supreme Court does not require proof of ownership. The, the, since it's a Supreme Court, proof of ownership should have been dealt with in the lower courts. But because the, the, the Arabs cannot go to the Israeli lower courts. Although they can go to the Supreme Court. They can go straight to the exactly. Supreme Court. And therefore, they overlook the proof of ownership. Fascinating. And therefore, the, 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 all of these claims, most of them, I mean, they, 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 they'll sell land, but then they have to deny it. Because if they sell land to a Jew, the Palestinian leaders will kill them. They have to either run away or hide. And uh, this is what happens. They sell land, they take the money, and then they say, well, you know, some brother or cousin shows up and said, it's mine. He sold it. He didn't have permission to sell it. And people have lost a lot of money that okay. way. Bottom line, the Supreme Court says to you, you've got to move. Yes. And so you do move. So we move. A few miles further uh, northeast, and that's where we are today. In 1980, the Elon Morav today started. How many families? Which was the third Elon Morav, yes, Menachem Begin said. Yes. There will be many Elon yes. Morav. He maybe knew what he was talking about. <laughs> yes. Uh, 450 families today. That's, you start, no, no. Oh, at the time, 10 families. 10 families? 10 families. By the way, you know, talk about pioneering spirit, right, Zev? It was. It, we were it, young. You were young we were and young, idealistic. Younger. Younger, idealistic, and yes. strong, and ready to... You oh, were, yes. We did everything I had to build, uh, do a lot of the work ourselves. With your own hands. Yes, yes. Was it an exciting time? Very. Very exciting, and and the support that we had in Israel was tremendous. From, from the people, Israelis in general. Israelis in general. The yes. issue of you were settlers and you were, now the army will have to protect you and it'll cost us money and you're a headache. No, we that were didn't pioneers. Then. We were pioneers. You were pioneers. We were pioneers. Yes. In the and you know it's interesting, in some way, the Israeli views, what settlers have done on the West Bank. I'm very uncomfortable with the word settler because mm -hmm. it, it, first of all, it stigmatizes. 
I don't like that. It's, it's, and second, the Israeli perspective is what you did in Shomron is no different than Jews did a generation earlier in Haifa and in virtually every community that was what became inside the Green Line. So that the Israeli mentality is, we're all pioneers, chalutzim. You're just chalutzim in the second generation, and your chalutzim tend to be creating homes and communities beyond the Green Line in as much part of Eretz Yisrael as Tel Aviv is Eretz Yisrael. Anywhere else, if not that, more. And as a result, you're telling me the Israeli in 1980 was supportive of what you were doing. Very, very. If you look at the newspapers from that, those times every day, it was very positive articles about it. Okay, from 10 families it grows into? Today, 450 plus. 450 plus. Mm -hmm. And is it basically a Jewishly homogeneous group of Orthodox Jews? Yes. Okay. Yes, basically it is. Okay. And should we imagine paved streets? People, it's very funny. People think of settlements. They think of a few tents and goats. Yes. Filo and More is today a town. Hopefully in the future it will become a city, but today it's a town. But I'm talking about the look, the look and the feel. In some way, you know, I, I tell people, if you can imagine parts of New Jersey, there's certain foliage that makes you think, oh, maybe you're in Florida. But you could, it feels like you're in a modern village in it, and you have synagogue, school, mikvah? Yes, of course. So at, at some point, Elon Moret also experiences some very difficult times in terms of Arab terrorist assault, correct? Yes, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't easy over the years. No, it was not. And anybody who wants to read about Elon Moret can read about the incidents. But you and your wife were living there. You have children? Yes. How many? Four children. Grandchildren? Uh, yes. That's nice. Okay. So you have four children who you raise in a little more? Yes. Okay. Were you ever worried for their safety? All the time. All the time. All the time, but not in a lone more. We were more worried on the roads when they had to travel. We always felt safe up until a point in a lone more. And uh, what does it mean up to a point? We we felt safe up until there was an incident where a Arab came into the town and went into a home and killed the family in the home, the Gavish family. In, it, in um, Elon Mora. In Elon Mora. Elon Mora is very near Itamar. Yes. And there was also a horrible incident yes. there. Yes. Where an Arab, came, an Arab terrorist came into a home, slit the throat of a three-month-old child in its bed, Virtually yes. killed the family. One child, luckily, was able to survive. And what you're saying is, in Elo Moreh, there was a similar type of incident. Yes, on a Pesach, when they had the incident in the Park Hotel in Netanya. Yes. So the next night, this happened in Elo Moreh. Where were you? I was in my home. The family lives across the sidewalk from me. Not even the road. This happens across the street from you? Yes, yes. So and that's terrifying. Yes, and uh, we heard the shots, and uh, all the men ran out with their rifles. We, ha we had rifles in the homes for security. And uh, the terrorist ran into one of the bedrooms and ran into a closet, and uh, he was killed. And... Uh, the mother, the father, their oldest son, and the grandfather, the mother's father, was killed by this terrorist. And uh, that was the point when I personally uh, felt that we had to take more serious thought to our security inside the town. And that's when I started to go and travel. And uh, I volunteer to raise funds for the security and other needs of the town 
What kind of security? Cameras. We have uh, cameras uh, around the town, night vision cameras that are monitored 24 hours, seven days a week, which have, uh, are also together with uh, radar, which motion detectors. I don't want to go into it too much on the air, but uh, thank God since then we haven't had another incident in the town. Is there a gate of any kind at El Mora? No, no, there's no so, fence and no gate. Okay. There so is a it's the, it's the barrier cameras. that comes down, though, that over the road, but that's just it on the road. And by the way, one of the reasons why you're in America right now, as mm -hmm. you say, you, you now do fundraising for Elon Moret. And one of the reasons why you're here is you're raising money for a park, sort of a central park. A children's which, playground. A children's playground. Mm -hmm. And it is being named after a child who was a victim of a terrorist attack. The child was only three days old. What happened? And uh, the parents were coming home to Elon Morer. They were visiting uh, family and friends. The mother was pregnant. The mother was in her seventh Seven month. Seven months, OK. Um, her name is Shira Ishran. And the father is Amichai Ishran. They were waiting at a bus stop outside of the town of Ofra. And uh, terrorists drove up, two terrorists, and they started shooting the people at the bus stop. Uh, she was critically injured. Her husband was shot in the leg. And in the hospital, she was, they didn't know if she would make it. They decided to do an emergency C-section. The baby was in distress. Um, he survived for three days and then died after three days. Um, the, they named the baby uh, uh, Ami Ad. Ami Ad. Ami Ad. Ami Ad Yisrael. Yisrael. Israel is my eternal nation. Yes. Forever nation. Yes. Yes. And you're going to create a playground. A children's essence, playground. In this child's name. Yes. Yes. Lovely. And it will be a place where the children of Elon Moray will be able to play safely and uh, will we'll, uh, remember this child. The, you grew up in America. You understand mm -hmm. how American Jews think. And American Jews hear this story and they look at the life you live. And in part they say, how do you do it? How do you live with that kind of reality? Not only the fear that it engenders. And, you know, I don't know how old your children were when this happens across the street from you. But it also could, it could traumatize a child for the rest of their life. Mm -hmm. And this is something you lived with. And then you were motivated to come and begin to raise funds to create the camera system and the security system that now protects Elon Moret. But I said to you, you know, is there fear? And you said yes, and you understand that while nothing has happened, something happens to people who are from Elon Moret all around you, and one never knows whether some crazy, some lunatic is going to say, I don't care what happens to me. I'm going to come in, and they'll have to shoot me, and before they shoot me, I'm going to, I'm going to kill as many Jews as I can. That's something you live with. Can you explain to us what's the mentality that would prompt you and your wife and the other families, 450 families living in, in Lone Moret, to live in that situation day after day after day? Do you know the, saying, the, the word in Yiddish? There's a Yiddish word. It's called bashert. It is meant to be. Yes, we feel very strongly as religious Jews that there's a plan. And you can be laying in bed at night and have a heart attack, God forbid. You can be crossing the street. You can be anywhere if it's your time. That's what's, you know, it's going to happen. So you think it was the time so I think for the family across the street? If I believe in God 
and I believe that everything is done, you know, there's evil in the world, and this freedom, freedom of, of God gives man the freedom to choose between good and bad. So it's, it's a little complicated. I don't think God wanted it to happen, but I think that things are set in motion by a higher authority. And I think that we, as believers in Hashem, put our trust to a certain extent in Hashem. And if it's whenever it is, when it's my time, it will be, whether it's a car accident, God forbid, or a sickness, an illness. or And I feel very strongly that, and I live my life where I'm not, when I say you live in fear, you, I'm not afraid of, you know, when I walk out of the house or I walk in the street, I don't, I don't uh, live my life in fear. But it's always in the back of my mind. I'm always looking around and, and, you and, do fear and aware fear, of my area. But you do fear for your children. I do fear uh, that everything will be all right for my children. And uh, we make decisions, whatever they are, to live in a certain place. We try to minimize, we, we, we try to minimize the security, you know, to have the best security and to take care of it. But, uh, you know, in, in, in Yerushalayim, there were buses blowing up and restaurants blowing up in Tel Aviv. Hello, Mara. You know, when when the rockets were going off in in with Saddam Hussein, people came to Elon Mara to stay because it, it wasn't safe in Ramat Gan and in Rishon Lezion. Now the rockets that are coming in from from Gaza, every you know now it's been quiet for a few days, but you can have like 300 rockets over a three-day period. Also, so I, I feel very strongly also that um, besides bashert, there's, there's bitachon. You know, there's, bitachon has two meanings. It's mil'el and mil'ra. In Hebrew, that means where the accent is put, on the end of the word or the beginning of the word. So it's bitachon is trust in God. And bitachon, actually bitachon is Trust and bitachon is security. So we do both at the same time. Mm -hmm. We worry about our security physically in preparing, and we also put our trust in God. Zev, do you hate Palestinians? Not at all. No. We, again, I can tell you stories. Tell me a story. I hope, I hope you have time. Tell me a story. When we started the town, so we never wanted to be a kibbutz. We wanted to be a, a, a city, a town, and a town needs a supermarket. So they asked me to set up the supermarket, and at that time, uh, no, no suppliers were coming out to the Shomron uh, to supply, so we had to go and bring everything ourselves, and we had to set everything up. And one of the places where I would go to bring the fruit and vegetables was in Shechem in the shuk, the farmer's market. I used to go down at 5 o'clock in the morning. It was still dark outside. Go into the farmer's market, buy off the trucks. They, they, the way they sold it was all auction. And, uh, they, you know, they would have a truck of tomatoes, and they'd have an auctioneer, and he'd uh, call off the, you know, the pricing for the for the uh, tomatoes, and the larger amount that you wanted, the lower the price. So I used to get together with the Arabs, the Arab uh, shopkeepers, and we used to combine our our purchasing. We would combine. Uh, I would need let's say 30 boxes, and he would need someone would need 40, and another one would need 20. So we'd get you know 100 boxes of tomatoes, which was a lot cheaper than if you just bought 10 or 20 boxes of tomatoes. And this is how, you know, we would, I, I would be down there and I'd be w walking around. We, we were very friendly. Sometimes, you know, it was all cash. So I'd be walking around with, with, with a pocket full of cash. And nobody ever tried to steal it from you? No, no. Sometimes I would, 
I would uh, be short, uh, and I'd still need, you know, that another few boxes of something, and they'd give me the money and says, you know, when you come tomorrow or the next day, you know, you can give it back. Uh, we had very, very good relations in the beginning with, with our neighbors, and uh, we used to get along very well. Our, the, the, they had no running water in, in the villages around Elon Mora when we first came. We set up their running water from us. When we got running water, they put it into the towns. They had no electricity. When, when, when we moved in, we, we set up the electric grid and gave them electricity. They, uh, their roads were, were one-lane roads. Now they're highways. So uh, We had very good relations okay. with them, but it all changed. It did change. It did change. When did it change? Oslo. Oslo, Oslo which was meant to make when, things better, Zev. Uh, well, bringing, it was meant bringing, to make things bringing, better. They thought it would make things better, Correct. those who were in favor of it. Right. But those, those who weren't knew that it would not be better. To did bring you know? Arafat. Did you know? Yes. Why? Why? What did you know I, that I knew, you wished other people knew at the time? I knew that Arafat wasn't interested in making peace with Israel. And, and uh, I knew that if they would bring him back uh, in, into, into Israel from Tunis, uh, they, Tunisia, they, it would be bad for them and bad for us. Okay, what happened? How did it change? The first thing was that they weren't allowed to have any relations or dealings with Jews. Anyone who had any relations or dealings with Jews would be beaten up or even killed or disappear. You know what happened to them. They uh, would go into a restaurant, sit down, order everything on the menu, get up and walk out. This is what I was told by, by, by friends that I still kept in touch with. Uh, they said they blamed us. They blamed the Israelis. They said, you, it's your fault. You, you brought them here to us. If you ask the average, well, I don't know today, because today there's a whole new generation that grew up since then. But you lost that touch. That has changed. With the community of Shechem. Yes, yes. Well, where did yes. you get your groceries after that? I used to, for, I, I, at that time, I wasn't running the grocery store anymore. The, well, whoever it was. I, I passed it on to... And, the, but they have to get it somewhere else, yeah, don't they? Yeah. They so can't they, get it in Shechem anymore. No, so they had okay. to go all the way to Tel Aviv. I asked you, do you hate Palestinians? You said no. Then things changed. Number one, do, did Palestinians, during the time you were dealing with Shechem, did Palestinians hate you? No. Okay. Do they hate you now? The younger generation, yes, probably. Why? Because that's what they were taught in school. They taught and in they schools weren't taught that before? No, no. The older generation, when, when the Israelis, after 67, went into those areas, life became much better for them. They had jobs. You would see that there were no roadblocks. They would go to Tel Aviv to the beach every Friday. They would work in, in, in factories in Tel Aviv, in Petach Tikva, in, in Kfar Saba, all over Israel. They were living a very, very comfortable, very good life. A lot of them gave up their fields even. They stopped being farmers because they were making more money in the building industry and in the, in the, in the factories working for Israelis. To, even today, if you went to Ariel or Barkan, there's an industrial area there where I would say 80% of the workers are Arab Palestinians from, from the towns around them. And they work side by side with the Jewish workers. They're paid the same wages as the Jewish workers. They have all the benefits of the Jewish workers. And uh, if you really want to see living together, um, you go into these industrial areas. They were threatened and told not to work there, but they don't care. They, they want to bring home a living to their families. So what do you think about people saying 
that the only way Israel can survive as a Jewish democratic state is if there is a two-state solution where there, a Palestinian state is created on the West Ridge. Most people that talk about a two-state solution, when I ask them two states for whom, don't know, don't tell me. Okay, because, but I do know. It's because, one Palestinian state and one Jewish state. Yes, and but are Jews, will Jews be allowed to live in the Palestinian state as Palestinians live in the Jewish state? Well, let me ask you something. If it turns out that there was real peace mm -hmm. between Israel and the Palestinian people, and there was a Palestinian state, and you were told, you want to live in Elo Moreh? No problem, but you're living under... Palestinian sovereignty, but you'll have it. You'll have it. You can live in in Elon Moret as a Jew. No one's going to bother you, but it won't be sovereign Israel. It'll be sovereign Palestinian state. If that were in a messianic world, an option to you, would it be acceptable for you to stay in Elon Moret but under Palestinian sovereignty? Personally, to me, Elon Moret is Eretz Israel. I understand. I want to live in Eretz Yisrael. If it's a real peace, yes. and I'm living there as I'm living today, yes. no fear. Exactly. Less fear. Less fear. Why not? Okay. And my point, and I hope everybody watching JBS right now, watching L'Chaim, hears you. My point is I speak to people who live on the West Ridge, whether it's Carnet Shomron, whether it's now... Elon Moret, I ask this question, every one of you says, yes. I don't believe it'll ever happen. You're talking about something that's absurd, but if it were to happen. Look what happened in, uh, in Gaza. They had, to, they had to take out the dead, I the know, buried. Know, they couldn't leave the dead know, people there. I know, I know, I know, I know. So you're asking something uh, right. that so now you're saying, now, well, if, if, if we set yes, up on, on the moon no, a no. settlement. It's theoretically imp important, Zev. It's important that people understand you're not some kind of fanatic who says, under no circumstance, no circumstance, will I permit this to be Palestinian land. What you are saying is, it has to be done in a way that you would expect any other civilized world to live in, any civilized place to be. And in that instance, yes, because the, the, the way it's always framed is, Israel have, will have to remove you. We'll have to remove now, what is it, 500,000? How many settlers? It's okay. a, close to that. Okay. So we'll, It'll be a five, million in another 20 years. Okay. And the argument is you and your 40 families started this back in 1980. It's your fault that there's no peace. Of course. Because you're the obstacle. And if Israel wouldn't erect more communities on the West Ridge, or if you and your wife would take your family and just get out of there, the Palestinians would be willing to make peace with us. And you say? Let me put it this way. They were offered 95% of the area that they want as their state, with 5% being exchanged. In other words, they were getting 100% of the quantity of land that they would have had for the whole state of, that they, you know, of, of Palestine. And they turned it down. They would not, I, I don't believe they will ever sign a peace treaty giving Jewish people a foothold in that area officially. They want the whole area. They want, you know, this is just a stepping stone for them. They said it themselves. Uh, they, and is there this, are quotes that you can look up. That is this Palestinian leadership, or is it the Palestinian people as well? The people follow their leaders either because they agree with them or because they're afraid to disagree. So there, there isn't, you can't talk about the Palestinian people without looking at their leaders. And today their leaders, the ones that are leading, will I don't believe we'll ever sign a piece of paper uh, agreeing to a two-state, what you call a two-state solution, because they will be recognizing Israel as a Jewish state, 
They will, ne they will never, whenever they talk about two states, they will never say a Jewish state and a Palestinian state. They say, and this is what I was alluding to before, they will say one state will be for all of its citizens and one state will be only for Arabs. Only for, and, and, and their hope is that eventually the state for all its citizens will have a majority of Arabs and we take over the, the state. Okay, why don't you think everybody doesn't understand the reality that you just described? I give them credit. I think they do see it. I think that they have an agenda that is not based on seeing what, what is in front of them, but they have an agenda that, how can I say without offending anybody, but how many Arabs are there in the world? How many Arabs are there in the world? Millions and millions and millions and I don't know how many. Billions? 300 million, maybe, yes. Well, Muslims, there are billions. Okay. How many Jews are there in the world? 12 million. Do I have to go further? Yes, you do. What are you really saying? What I'm saying is that they, they the people that, that are in, in favor of, for instance, um, BDS, right? that's a hot topic. I don't think they're concerned with human rights. Because look what's going on elsewhere in the world. Look at Syria, look at, look at the other Arab countries. I don't think they're concerned at all with human rights. They're concerned with one thing, destroy Israel. I think that there are people in this world that say if Israel did not exist, maybe things would be better for us. And I think uh, that's where these people are coming from. Do you have any hope as we're sitting here today together that the Trump administration's peace plan, which begins with a large economic plan that is supposed to infuse billions of dollars into the Palestinian community and ultimately is supposed to be contingent upon their willingness to enter at peace with Israel. Do you have any hope that the Trump administration plan has a realistic chance of being successful on any level? The only way that plan would be successful is if the people revolt against their leaders. There's no chance that it will be successful with the leaders that they have today. And what chance do you think there is of a revolt? Very slim at this time. Because they'll put down the revolt. They, see, when they, when, when they want to put down a protest, they have no problem. You don't have the UN, you don't have all of the so-called people that are in favor of human rights coming out into the streets with, with screaming and, 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 and condemning them. They have no, the, the, the Arabs have absolutely no problem with what's going on in Syria, how Assad is putting down a revolt of the people. So they'll just kill everybody. They'll just, you know, anybody, the, the jails in the Palestinian territories are full of people that spoke out against Abbas and against uh, the Palestinian Authority. They're afraid, they're, uh, they're afraid to, to say anything. So I don't think that at this time It'll maybe reach a point, and when it does reach that point, they, they always have like a, uh, a stopgap or something to, to change the, 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 the story, right? They start sending a few missiles into Israel, and they start uh, screaming about how, 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 how they're being uh, persecuted by Israel, and everything is forgotten. So uh, I, don't, I don't think that people, but that's the only way, the only way. The, bi the biggest mistake, unfortunately, was Oslo, the Oslo Accords. The, I, I, I can't, 
stress enough that the people who brought Oslo, the Oslo plan to Israel, should be sitting in jail today. They, they get there walking around free, still talking about you know, how, how it's Israel's fault that, that it didn't work. I was introduced to you through your cousin, Charlie, and Charlie and Sue. And I was anxious to meet you. You are a real mensch and a lovely person, and I've enjoyed meeting you. I Thank wish you kol tu as you, you know, go through America trying to raise money for the Children's Park at Elon Moret. And I hope that you, know, you and your wife continue to live in a life of health and joy and with simcha and happiness and nachas from your children and grandchildren uh, for years and years and years and years. And maybe the next time you're in America, you'll stop by and we'll continue the conversation. Okay. Fair enough. Kol tu Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Zev Safra, a resident of the Wedgebridge community of Elon Moret and a lovely, lovely Jew who's trying to make a difference in the land of Israel and Eretz Israel for the Jewish people. As always, I invite you to be in touch with me with any thoughts or comments you may have to any of the ideas expressed on this edition of L'Chaim. Please email me, write me, post on our Facebook page, or tweet me. I look forward to hearing from many of you. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. L'Chaim, my friends, to life. education in media. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, P.O. Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.